Hello. I thought I would share a little bit on the theme, go into some practice and then share some more and then open it up for conversation. Um, so knowing that the world is intense and complex at the easiest of times and we are not in the easiest of times. Um, there's a lot happening that is um, harming many, many people, re-traumatizing many, many people, bombarding visually and physically um, in so many ways. And so just wanting to hold tenderness for however we're showing up tonight um, and knowing that we'll be hearing <laughs> and practicing and interpreting things through different lenses and filters. And um, that's the living Dharma. <laughs> That's how it goes. And so we'll do our best. Uh, I will do my best. I hope that we'll all do our best to um, to make space for the many, many ways that we are here together um, and the ways that we are living and um, challenged in this moment and also maybe inspired, which is part of the, tonight's theme. So hello, welcome. Um, this theme of Dharma and desire is, is loaded. Um, I was a monastic for many years and, and even words like needs were almost dirty words. It'd be this like sense of, no, 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 we don't need to focus on our needs. We can just let go of our preferences. And, and there's almost like this, um, glorification of not needing things or circumstances to be a particular way. And in some ways there's so much wisdom because there's a lot of ways that we humans get very stuck upon. I need this this way and I, I need that and I want this and it causes a lot of suffering. And yet there's a degree to which denying um, our human impulses and our nervous systems <laughs> interpretations of what is safe and what is okay that becomes actually really damaging so that some of some of the, the background of my own interest in this topic, which is also connected to the specifics that a lot of us think of desire and the more sensual and sexual kind of way which. Um, yeah, as, as Buddhist practitioners, especially as lay practitioners can almost seem like do I just have to ignore the Dharma to have a sex life. <laughs> Um, and this not actually has to be the case, but it's very rarely spoken about. So I wanted to give us a chance to look at a few teachings, do some practice, and then open it up some more. So for tonight's um, practice and focus and exploration, I want to bring in two words, tanha, T-A-N-H-A, which is used in the suttas to describe or translated as um, thirst or clinging or craving. And it is said to be the cause of dukkha or suffering. And then chanda, which is translated as desire or intention, um, which is actually neutral and can, we can have many, many types of chanda. So tanha, is rarely even translated as desire. And yet I think that in our cultural imagination and in common parlance, craving and desire sometimes get, um, get uh, interpreted to be the same thing. And yet this distinction is really important because um, at a very, very physical kind of level, the craving aspect that causes the suffering is the the tightening the the seizing the drawing in the grasping the i'm i need it this way and then we get all tight or our minds get tight and fixated so we can also think of fixation as as another synonym for tanha whereas chanda does not inherently have the tightening so you can have dhamma chanda, the, 
the zeal to learn the Dhamma, and that's seen as a very, very positive thing. Um, and there are um, chandas that are neutral, all sorts of in variations on this term, but um, it doesn't have the tightening, it doesn't have the grasping, clenching, the fixation. Um, and if you think about intention, uh, something that we have the intention and then we like put our energy into doing it, that's actually um, incredibly life-giving and, and we need some sort of intention to even engage in practice in the first place. And so the desire or the intention aspect is fundamental to a practice of the Dhamma. So I wanted to invite us into a period of practice, and it's going to start a little more conceptually, but then move into a, a more traditional contemplative kind of practice. So if you can just start off by thinking of something that you tend to feel tanha for. <laughs> um, not needing to pretend to be a, uh, any different than we are. We all have our tanhas, our things that we're like, oh, I want this, I need this. And it doesn't always feel like suffering. We wouldn't grasp at it if at some of it didn't just feel really good. <laughs> <laughs> our nervous systems don't work like that. <laughs> um, so whether you know it's ice cream or sex or a certain show um, or you know a certain way that you write out your schedule and the list just looks perfect you know like whatever it is it's like oh, i want it like this can you find your own body's version of the tightening the grasping, the fixating, maybe it's more hardening and tightening. Maybe it's more leaning forward. Notice any embodied pattern that happens in the head. in the chest. In the arms and hands. Is there any pattern that arises or set of sensations? that you notice you come up around craving, clinging, fixating. Down in the guts and the pelvis and the hips. I want this. How does that feel? Into the legs and feet. And can you remember or imagine your reaction and response on an embodied level to like a milder version of wanting or preference that has a little bit of that clinging in it? It might have a similar physical pattern, it might have a different pattern. Can 
Might just be a little bit of pressure in the mind, in the head, in the jaw. Can we know for yourself this experience of tanha? Then, can you tune in to a memory or an experience where there wasn't tanha or where it released? How does that feel in the body? A moment of non-craving, non-clinging. Does the posture shift at all? Is there a muscular tone that you can recognize as non-craving, non-grasping? A pattern in the breath, the tone of the overall quality of mind. And finally, can you bring to mind uh, a situation or a thing to which you have a, a more of a neutral relationship that, that has this, this aspect of chanda, whether it's the intention and motivation to practice meditation, um, to care for a loved one, um, this sort of energy that has some desire in it without the, the clinging part. I want to be able to make food for my family i want to be able to there's a there's a kind of wanting that is much more that's very different from the clinging so just have some reflections for yourself maybe find one particularity and then notice how that pattern shows up in the embodied experience, whether it's strong or mild.
And so, seeing if, if you can have your own awareness of the difference between the fixation, clinging energy, and the intention, motivation, energy, which may or may not relate to the non-clinging energy. For the next um, 15 minutes or so, I'd like to invite us into whatever is your normal meditation practice, whether that's resting awareness in the contact of body and the ground or any supporting surface, awareness of breathing, awareness of sounds, so finding an anchor for attention to rest into, knowing that it will move away, and then we invite it back. So finding this resting spot, seeing if we can relax just a little more into this here and now experience. Resting into the anchor, resting into the ground. At the same time, bringing a little more interest, a little more effortless effort or joyful effort to just wake up attention a little bit more to get a little more curious about how things are right now. And then from time to time, I'm going to drop in an invitation to just check, is there a little bit of clinging energy? Is there some intention, chanda energy? Is there some non-clinging? And if you're not sure, you don't even need to find a final answer. Just noticing on the subtler levels, is there any sort of holding on to like, oh, I wish, I wish it was like last week where I had that great meditation. <laughs> I was so calm, so nice. Oh, maybe some clinging. <laughs> or there's some discomfort, but there isn't any pushing it away. There isn't any wanting something different. Oh, that's some non clinging. Or maybe a moment of coming back to the anchor and sort of reigniting that intention to be present. Oh, some Dhamma Chanda.
And right now, is there any wanting it to be different? Any craving? Any non-craving? Any intention present? And right now, in the body-mind stream, is there any wanting things to be different? Is there an absence of wanting things to be different? Is there any intention energy present? Just noticing for a few moments Returning to the anchor, letting everything come and go.
again checking in. Even if there isn't strong preferences or craving at the physical or material level, is there a, a thin residue of wanting one's experience to be different or one's sense of self to be just a little different? That too is the tanha, subtly. Or is there an absence of even the subtle tanha? And is there any energy of the intention to explore and manifest the Dhamma that's being known within this experience too? Noticing and then Turning to the anchor. And checking in again. Is there any tanha craving? And the mind may say, there are horrible things happening in the world. Of course they want it to be different. That's not so much the exploration of tanha. If there's heartbreak, Are we resisting and wanting the heartbreak to be different? Can we have some non-craving, non-tanha, not wishing and needing the heartbreak to be different in response to the state of our world? That too is an expression of cessation of dukkha release from suffering. To close this part of our practice together, I'm going to share a poem 
from one of the first awakened nuns called Sama. After 25 years on the path, I'd experienced almost everything except peace. When I was young, my mother told me that I would find true happiness only in marriage. Remembering her words all those years later, something in me began to tremble. I gave myself to the trembling and it showed me all the pain this little heart had ever known and how countless lives of searching had brought me at last to the present moment which I happily married. Can you imagine? We've been living together ever since without a single argument. bring movement and sight back into your experience or you may want to stay in a meditative state so in some ways I want to name that this is a or I would say a bit more of a classical, yet a somatic slash classical dharma kind of exploration of the ways that our wanting that internal experience to be different causes suffering. And though sometimes it sounds quite dry and harsh, there's also this great love. I, I, I choose to use the word love in, in in the teachings that are saying like it's worthy you are worthy of not suffering all beings are worthy of knowing the experience of non-suffering we don't have to force ourselves to add extra pain and and misery to what's already hard being live um and i've i've grown and learned so much from these kinds of explorations of Where's the craving? Where's the wanting? And learning to open and soften. And I, I often come to the experience of a fist and a hand where I just check in. Oh, am I, am I grasping something? Or can I open to just enjoy whatever is pleasant with an open palm, with an open heart? And just softening the craving, tightening tanha sometimes actually turns into this beautiful path of enjoyment <laughs> like oh, i want this thing i want more of it i want to be different <clears throat> oh but is there anything that's already okay to just be with and to offer love even even to the painful parts um, can actually be this beautiful pathway into um enjoyment <laughs> very surprising um I and mean, if you've been around the dharma for a while you may like me have also internalized some of this sort of negative um sort of dismissing or looking down on anything that's pleasant which is i truly believe not the the heart and center of the buddha's teachings but whether it's a question of translation, um, a question of, you know, cultural mismatch and not catching all the nuances, not just translating from language to language, but from era to era to culture, little differences, um, that there, yeah, I, I, I think, I think I can just say flat out there's 
I have experienced streams within the Dhamma, nuances that are very anti pleasure that speak negatively of all desire. Um, and especially if we're looking at the realm of sensuality and sexuality, you know, most of the Buddhist stories are of monastics. And so, of course, they're celibate because that's that's the deal. <laughs> that's, that's how it works. You know, it's not a surprise. Um, and with the monastic path, you're not allowed to have your own bank account or phone or home or, you know, traditionally in the Buddhist time, they couldn't keep food overnight. Like, there's nothing wrong with those things, but this was a very extreme path to be able to focus all one's attention into awakening. And so sex was also one of the things, like having your own home, that in my understanding, there's nothing wrong with it, <laughs> but it wasn't part of the monastic form. Uh, and yet there was very little said to the lay practitioners. Um, And then I look at some of the sutras where, you know, there's even um, in the Sharangama, one of the Mahayana suttas, the story of uh, Ananda, the Buddha's foremost attendant and, and the sort of person who memorized most of the sutras and repeated them, his cousin. Um, <laughs> now this didn't happen in the Pali canon, this happened in the Mahayana, a bit more um, cosmic, almost psychedelic kind of things going on in some of these stories. Um, but at the beginning of the, the sutra, Ananda um, got lured in by a courtesan, or I think it's fair to say a sex worker, um, and he almost broke his precepts. He was about to have sex with her when the Buddha could see what was going on uh, and called them both to <clears throat> like whisk them both to, to his assembly and then gave this beautiful long teaching. Um, and even though it's not the center of the sutra, I find it really interesting that Prakriti, the, 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 the sex worker who had you know been raised by a mother who was also a sex worker. Um, and she had seen how this like very peaceful, beautiful monk and, and was so in love with him that she like, had this potion or some sort of spell that she cast and what have you so they were both listening to the teaching and actually she became enlightened first um <laughs> because the energy of her sort of passion for ananda was so strong that it actually gave her the energy that just needed this little shift and it actually carried her into awakening faster than Ananda, <laughs> who had already been hearing the Buddha for, for decades. Um, and so in that story, I was, I was very touched with like, all oh, it was, it was a bit of a, an affirmation of some of the goodness in the energy of desire. And yet, even in that story, she becomes enlightened, she becomes none, she becomes celibate. <laughs> that the ultimate awakening doesn't include staying with that energy, but using it. Um, and I was kind of disappointed <laughs> in that story. Now, there are other stories of enlightened householders who aren't monastics. And it's fine, they're having sex. It doesn't have to be an impediment. But this whole question of like, where is the, what is the role of desire in the Dharma? Um, is, it's not clear. <laughs> Um, there are many different interpretations, different ways of, of looking at the sutras. Um, and so I just, I, I wanted to have this as the theme tonight, not so much to give like a big final answer and thesis, but to open conversation, to open our own explorations of like, how do we find for ourselves which energies are causing us more suffering and which are actually life-giving and energizing and and feed that dhamma chanda that energy that intention that can actually propel us along a path of freedom it's really important um, that 
when I look at the story of Prakriti, this nun, you know, she was completely consumed by a very sensual desire. She was, you know, ensnaring someone, <laughs> cast a spell on him. Um, but the strength of that energy was, uh, there was also like a, said that in the commentary in the sutras, for what that means, that like there was also something so pure in her love for him that that's what got her so close to awakening and adjusting this little nudge for her to be like, oh yeah, I shouldn't be trying to control somebody else. <laughs> Should <laughs> And once that was freed, but like that the, the heart opening kind of gave her this energy to propel her along the path. And, and that image of like, how can also some of our desires or our deep enjoyments and our, our connections be an energy that actually helps propel us in the directions that we want to grow in our healing in our awakening um and i know often my mind will sort of spin these things around and try to figure it out and the mind can be very tricky <laughs> and get very lost in thoughts but i find that this somatic this embodied reflection is often pretty trustworthy where there's the tightening and the grasping or the pushing and like <clears throat> fixating um, sometimes just the softening of muscles or that sort of like releasing a bit of the pressure in the mind that's going like <clears throat> if only it was like that then it makes that space for like oh wait oh wait a minute actually right here now there's a moment of non-suffering and that's one of the translations of nirvana why don't i enjoy that right here and now um unless this sounds you know like just like something that matters when you're sitting in formal meditation in a quiet place all secluded um as if there was nothing else happening anywhere in the world and there was no structural systemic violence and colonial her horrors continuing um, and oppression and and our own personal tragedies unfolding. Um, this isn't just something that we do in the cushion. It's <laughs> we train in formal times so that these moments of calamity and crisis. Uh, we might have a little more capacity that you know we get swept up and and turned around and in, in the heartbreak of it all and then that moment of being able to go oh, what if it's okay that i'm heartbroken about this or that i'm raging and that the non wanting the rage to be different softening around that even that can be a moment of freedom And in the, the deep pleasure, the like <laughs> third ice cream or like, you know, having a beautiful sexual encounter and you're just starting to notice that tightness coming. Oh, what if what if I soften the tightness and just really open to the beauty and let it in and take in the good? That's we're also where we can be practicing. Sometimes it is as simple as softening, the fixating the tightness, or the going, what, what part am I doing this to that I could do this to, from, from a, a clasped hand to an open palm. which is often not an easy thing to do. <laughs> and in fact, it's, it's actually not a gentle thing to do many of the times. Sometimes we need this strength of the intention of the Dhamma Chanda to go, oh, wait a minute, I'm really stuck in this. And whew, this is hurting. And this is, this is awful what's happening. And what am I adding to myself that is not necessary? <laughs> What, what are the suffering am I adding that's unnecessary? 
can I find that extra strength to go ungrasp? <laughs> Sometimes it takes a lot of strength and effort. You know, when I, I read a I should would have could have should have um, brought it in, but I read a you know many wise many unwise things passing around on in social media, but some really wise things. And and there was this um, mother talking about a conversation with her child of like, yeah, it's horrible what is happening in Palestine and Israel. And of course you want to turn away, but the only way that our hearts get stronger to love more fully is by not turning away from what is horrible and painful. And so that's also we're like getting to know the things that strengthen our capacity to live in the direction that we actually intend. It's good to know that. Good to know what what are our sources of strength, what what can grow it. it gives us this like larger than self power. Because sometimes we can just say, "Oh, look, I'm I'm grasping. I'm." stuck and clinging i'm just going to decide very mindfully and calmly <laughs> to go from grasping to simply open palmed clasping uh appreciating but most of the time if we're stuck it's because there's a lot of pain there's old traumas being touched upon triggered there's you know arguments happening in our families and across the globe and threats of you know losing employment or her our friends you know worried about having their bombs dropped on their homes right like those are, those are not moments where most of us are able to just very calmly and rationally make a decision because if we look at it neurobiologically our our whole sense of safety and our attachment system is is triggered our limbic system our our brain stem that's in charge those parts don't listen to the rational mind they go I'm going to take over because it's too dangerous <laughs> for the very slow, laborious kind of rational thought. Um, but if we've practiced and practiced and practiced the, the simpler moments of contraction to openness, and especially if we know how to feel it in the body, as opposed to just through the thoughts that can distort themselves more easily, we may be able to, to okay, I, I can't necessarily talk myself down from this big trigger, but I can soften my shoulders, even though I'm feeling like really jacked up. And then that softening the shoulders starts to reconnect <laughs> the limbic, the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex if we're speaking neurobiologically. Um, and it's in this aspect of like, where do we learn for ourselves the goodness in our desires, the life energy? It can only come through, I think, actually a very meditative reflection. Because if we're just sort of briefly going like, oh, yeah, like I know this kind of thing that I do is fine and that that that's an addiction, but it's not so bad. Like, And we're only coming from the, the thinking mind, our unreflected habitual perceptions of ourselves or actions or interactions that kind of thinking will lie to us quite often <laughs> or, or it will distort things um, and it may not actually uh, play out the way that it says it does but with a meditative contemplative reflection and a capacity to not just think about it but feel into Oh yeah, I keep doing this thing and I keep expecting it to, to make me feel better, but does it? And that little voice in the brain that's like, oh yeah, totally, totally, totally. <laughs> right? Okay, there's a voice saying, sure, but wait a minute. Is there any other part of me that's going, mm, actually it doesn't. That, we can only know that through really reflecting on our own experience through taking time, through taking space, which is the path to our inner liberation, but it's also our path to having a sense of like, what's the next right step that I can do to 
support my community and to live engaged in my values in the world. It's all connected. It's all a, a process that that feeds <laughs> feeds from the personal to the interpersonal collective, which isn't actually different if we stay with it long enough. So um, Mark Epstein, a psychiatrist and Dharma teacher, has written many books, um, has a book called Open to Desire, <laughs> looking at uh, desire from a Buddhist context, as well as in some of the, the Hindu uh, stories of Ramayana, the story of Rama and Sita, um, as well as Western psychology. And so in his words, when desire is not denied or suppressed, but allowed to grow in the light of knowing that there is no ultimately satisfying self or object. So like really knowing the unsatisfactoriness <laughs> of objects and states because they're temporary, because they're ungraspable. We really know that and we don't suppress or deny our desire. There's a tremendous development of inner life that is possible. <laughs> This is a third way with desire, not denying or grasping. And out of this new approach comes the ability to empathize with another's experience, not looking for others or for objects to gratify us, but we can actually transform the inner experience of desire into spiritual nourishment. And so not going to read the whole book to you if you're interested you can <laughs> dive into that further but this this piece of it, it seems like a paradox that we actually need to really face how the things that we usually turn towards to feel okay to feel better that we want they do not give the happiness that that our brains are telling us they will give and yet, if that becomes denial, repression, suppression, um, demonization, that too is another kind of suffering, is another kind of getting stuck. And this is also what I've found, uh, is that there's actually an importance in both not getting stuck in desires, but also not being aversive to desires. Because I definitely develop some of that as a monastic. I think I spoke about this in a, in a talk a few weeks ago around the third precept in sexuality and um, that I notice, especially if I'm in a Dharma space and a little, any degree of like sensual, sexual, romantic attraction arises, in regards to someone else, I have this automatic like, oh, <laughs> push it down, especially because it's a Dharma space and I'm so used to being a monastic, <laughs> even though it's been a few years. And so I'm having to go, oh, wait a minute. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not necessarily gonna act on <laughs> anything in this moment, in this retreat, in this meditation sit, but that inner part that's pushing, that's aversive, that is seeing this as bad and wrong, that's also a craving or wanting it to be different that's, that's unhelpful. And I'm needing to practice just letting the desire <laughs> not be seen of as a problem. Because that that part, that particular way of some threads of Dharma that have this aversion or this um, demonization of desire. I definitely in, internalized some of that. Um, and it's not just from the Dharma, you know, there's many spiritual and religious traditions. 
<laughs> that have a lot of negative things to say about any type of desire, uh, any of the impulses of the body. Um, so there's many ways that we can internalize messages. And then also, you know, capitalism, colonialism, it's all about denying uh, our, our animal and communal bodies, whether it's uh, normalizing violence and, and having to numb responses or um, all sorts of ways that sort of denying these very, very natural <laughs> impulses of the body have been culturally, religiously perpetuated in so many ways. Um, but there's like really important work in liberating our desires while also recognizing the limitations. It's this funny paradox, but both are true. So I don't know if that even makes sense to y'all. <laughs> Hope it does. <laughs> hope there's some helpfulness, and especially I hope that this aspect of like coming into the body to start learning for ourselves. Um, I think so often a sort of Western educational model leaves folks asking, and they would ask us all the time when they would come to Q and A's at the monastery, "How do I meditate so I never do it wrong? <laughs> How do I do this the right way so I never have to deal with doing it the wrong way?" That was sort of at the basis of a lot of questions. Um, and that's impossible. So my questions are like, how do I know <laughs> when I'm getting stuck in the way of practice that's hurting me so that I can know the difference from the kind of practice that is actually helping me? How do I know the different states, which was some of the impetus behind the meditation just this evening? It's like, oh, can I really know what it's like when I'm stuck in the craving that's hurting me? Oh, if I can know that, then I can know it's absence from experience. And then I, you know, check in with teachers or I check in with formal teachings to like, you know, that's not just purely inner absorption of <laughs> or self-obsession. <laughs> um, but it has to have this, you look at your own experience, we can learn these things from our own lives. It's not just other people who will point the way. We can all learn this for ourselves. It's actually very empowering, but it's also very challenging. And even if it's, you know, a day or a year into the binge or whatever kind of fixation on our unhelpful cravings, the moment we notice it, is the moment we notice it. That's when we can start working with it. That's just how it goes. So I'm going to invite three sounds of the bell to close this portion of reflection. And then we'll see if there's some conversation that emerges. And thank you for showing up and practicing and engaging in this reflection.